Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I know it's been a while since I've done video, but the Lord has placed on my heart to share something with you. Um, essentially, the message that I want to deliver today is about faith, hope, and love. We know that the Bible talks about these three, three things in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 13. And we know that these are very important elements to our journey, faith, hope, and love. Love obviously being the most important because you can have all the other gifts, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. You can have the gift of prophecy. You can talk in tongues. You can, um, you know, go to your death um, because of your, your um, commitment to God. But if you don't have love, um, again, it's, it's useless because love is the only thing you'll carry on with you, um, in, you know, into the, the eternal. Um, and we must do all things in love. We must, you know, even correct in love. Um, you know, there is a nice way to do things. There is a nice way to speak to people. There is a nice way to, um, you know, um, you can rebuke a person, but you can do it in love. Um, you can guide a person. People fall and, and they make mistakes in this journey. But it's not condemnation that makes them correct themselves. Um, condemnation, you will know, came from the Pharisees in Jesus' time. Remember the adulterous woman when they pulled her out in the crowd and they were ready to stone her? But Jesus basically said, who, he who is without sin can throw the first stone. And no one was without sin. God didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save them, to save us. He wants none to perish. And Jesus was the man that um, extended a hand for the sinner to get back up again. So every time I've stumbled in my life, Jesus didn't want me to stay down. He didn't want to trample over me while I was down and kick me and lay the boot into me. I beat myself up enough for my sins, for my failures. Um, and when I did that, I was without hope. I was defeated and I felt like giving up. That's what the enemy does. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. So, we know that it's a battlefield in our mind all the time. And so when I had sinned against God, um, yes, I felt guilt. I felt remorse. But I am meant to be convicted of what I've, what I've done wrong and to turn from it. But the enemy wants you to be defeated. He wants you to give up hope. He doesn't want you to get back up on your feet and continue pursuing Jesus and, and um, continue on the narrow path. He doesn't want you to fight the good fight or um, endure till the end. Uh, so faith, hope and love, are very important things that continue all the way through your life. They are things that you um, persist at. So what I'm trying to say, <laughs> sorry, is I just want to break it down into a few separate categories because they're just really important elements of our walk. Um, you know, Jesus wants us to have faith like a child. And he is our heavenly father. And when you think about our father-child relationship, now I know that we live in a broken world and so not all relationships are perfect. I know that there are broken homes and, you know, broken parents that don't parent their children right. So it's not a good example of what our Heavenly Father's love for us is. However, when you have childlike faith, you think about a young child who's only two or three. He doesn't doubt where his provision's going to come from. He doesn't doubt that his daddy won't do something for him when he asks. Um, he, you know, obviously he, the child will be disciplined and have rules and guidelines, but he he knows that his father is there for him and he doesn't doubt his father's love. Um, 
again, I know in a broken world, we have broken fathers that don't, you know, they do neglect their children and sadly then a child can be brought up with a skewed view of what love really is and what even childlike faith is because, like I said, childlike faith trusts in your parents completely for all your provisions, all the love that you need, all the um, uh, food provision, clothing provision, all of that. A little two-year-old doesn't think, oh, mommy's not going to have food for me tonight. You know, like they're not thinking about those things. They know that they will be provided for. And as parents, we know how to give good gifts. We know how to make sure the needs of our children are met. Even when we have to struggle hard to do it, we still make sure their needs are met. We, we become selfless. We, we lay ourselves down to provide for our children. Again, I know it doesn't all work um, for everybody, depending on their upbringing and their brokenness. But when we think about that childlike kind of faith, God wants us to have that faith in him for our provision. Um, he doesn't want us being worried um, about our finances and about where the next meal is going to come from and all that sort of stuff. Um, your faith can grow so much that you do have a childlike faith. You have a childlike faith that lets go of your own, um, own ability to uh, take care of yourself because often we put our trust in the things that we do. We put our trust in our faith, in our career, um, our ability to earn money um, and to provide when God says, no, I want you to put my trust, your trust in me. Um, so faith is a really important thing. And um, I can't stress enough that it's meant to be childlike. God's been talking to me uh, about that a lot, even in relation to healing. Um, you know, when a child trusts his parents so much. Um, you think of a child that looks up to their mum or dad and knows their mum or dad has an ability to do something. Um, so if their mum is skilled at baking, for instance, and they're at school and their mum's and they're having a fate and they say, can your mum bring cupcakes or cakes or something to the fair? And they go, my mum can do that. My mum can make cakes. My mum can do that. She can bring cakes. Um, <laughs> you know, when a child has that kind of faith in the ability of their parents, now, um, God wants us to have the same ability, uh, faith in his ability to do things for us. So, uh, when he was talking to me about healing, you know, when Jesus walked up to someone, he just said, get up and walk, get up and walk. Um, you know, he didn't have to go through this lengthy prayer. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying Jesus knew what his father could do. He had no doubt at all in his heavenly father. He had no doubt that the God who created each and every one of us can heal and restore completely. And so we're meant to have that childlike faith. He commented a lot on different people's faiths, like the centurion who said, you know, about just just give the order to be well and you don't even have to come into our house, you know, because I know what it's like to give orders and receive orders and just say go and do. And um, God really wants us to just know that he is able and we can just say be healed, you know, my God can do that. My Father, my Heavenly Father can do those things. And he wants our faith to be like that, to trust him in all things, to know, to know that he is able. Um, and so I know that that kind of faith is built over time because when God manifests himself in your life and starts to do little things, um, over time you become... Um, used to or maybe just you know he he shows himself in so many different situations and areas of your life that your faith does increase um, and so I just wanted to encourage you that he is always there even when you can't see him and I remember one time where I was driving along and it was a beautiful sunny day I had no idea there was any rain coming I was driving along on my way somewhere and all of a sudden it just seemed like this storm came out of nowhere Gray scouts, gray clouds everywhere. And in like a minute or two, it was pouring down rain. 
And as I was driving through the storm, I mean, I eased off. It was very hard. It was pouring so hard. And my wipers were going at full speed. And I slowed down a bit because the vision was was difficult. Um, and I, for a moment, thought, wow, like I couldn't see any clear sky anymore. And I thought for a moment, wow, this rain is set in for the day. That's how dark it was and ominous. And I didn't stop and turn around my car and go back home. I kept going in the direction that I was going in because I had a destination to go to, but I just took precautions in the dangers of the storm. You know, I, I eased up a bit, wipers going, put my headlights on even. Um, and God was speaking to me as I was driving because, you know, we do walk through storms in life and God is with us and he wants us to have faith that he is always there even though we can't see him. So the sun was still out. The sun was still shining. It's just that I couldn't see the sun through the darkness of the clouds. And that's like our trials sometimes. You just, you can't see God um, through the thick clouds and, and the storm that you're facing. But God doesn't want you to turn around or stop or go back. Um, it might cause you to slow down a minute. You know, we do sometimes. We don't always power on full speed ahead. Um, but he gives us the tools to manage the storm. He gives us the tools to get through it. And um, and as I this particular day, as I kept driving, I swear this um, storm only lasted about three minutes. And as I came out the other side, I was amazed because it was fully clear sky again and no evidence of the storm that I just walked, uh, drove, driven through. Um, and the Lord was just pointing out that he is always there. He is always there. And we can have faith even though we can't see him, that he is there and he has plans for us and he wants to, um, he will finish the work he started in you. Um, he has plans to give you a hope and a future and uh, he wants you to overcome. He wants you to overcome your situation. He wants you to overcome your trials and he wants you to um, just overcome in life. And when you overcome in life, you can have joy and peace in all your circumstances, no matter what they look like, because you know that God works all things for his good. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on that. Um, and I have a couple of verses that I've written down. Um, Psalm 42, 11 says, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Um Romans 8, 24 to 25. Now hope is that is seen. Sorry. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Um, Psalms 33, 18 to 19. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. We know that hope is the that we're waiting for something we do not see. We know from the word of God that there is something beyond this life that there is an eternal life. So we're uh, currently inhabiting um, flesh, vessels of flesh, vessels of clay, earthly vessels, and at some point we will pass from this life, this body will return to ash, to dust, and um, our soul will continue on to a, a life eternal. And, you know, God, um, well, we have faith and hope in that what Jesus said and did is complete. You know, Jesus said it is finished when he died on the cross. It's called a good news gospel for a reason, because it gives us good news. It's not good news if <laughs> you do this. <laughs> it's good news because... The Holy Spirit or God does all the work from beginning to end. 
he is able to finish the good work he started in each and every one of us. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because there are doctrines of man that cause a lot of confusion. And that confusion doesn't help the body of Christ. It does not help the body of Christ at all. I don't use the term once saved, always saved. And wait before you click off. Let me explain. That sentence is not in the Bible, okay? However, the debate that has gone on on so many channels has caused a lot of confusion within the body. And I'll tell you why. We know that Jesus gave a parable about the seeds. Seed, which is the word of God that fell on different types of soil. Some that didn't take root and died. Okay. And some that endured uh, or, or, or grew down deep roots and, and flourished and produced good fruit. But we also know that we all start life as a babe in Christ. When you accept Jesus as, as your savior, you start as a babe. And you have to grow into maturity. So just like a seed starts as a seedling, it doesn't produce fruit as a seedling. It has to grow into maturity before it produces fruit. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because when all this debate started coming out, again, uh, with relation to whether once, I, uh, once saved, always saved was the truth, or no, you have to work um, because faith without works is dead. Um, and that is the scripture verse, mind you. Faith without works is dead. There's a lot of confusion out there for the body of Christ. And we have to make something perfectly clear. God will finish the work he started in each and every one of us. We are called to run the race of faith. We're in court, we are called to endure to the end. So we're not meant to give up. A seed that dies, a seedling that dies and doesn't produce fruit because they've given up. They've turned away. They've turned away from the faith because the trials of life became so hard and they didn't have faith. This is my point. When all that confusion, and it still exists, it still exists in the body of Christ, I started to doubt when along my own journey did I become saved. Obviously, in 2013, I had a major shift spiritually, a big awakening, and the Lord was um, telling me to wake the bride. And so I started to wonder, was I saved before I was awake? I was confused. Was I finally awake? Now, uh, was I a Christian when I wasn't awake? Um, but I do know that I was a Christian when I first believed. I know that that moment that I came to repentance before him, weeping at the cross, when I recognized, when I recognized that sacrifice that he did on the cross for me, that moved my spirit so much because I knew that every sin I had ever committed was nailed on that cross. I knew in that moment that he did that for me, that he bore the punishment for my sins. And that was the hour I first believed. That was the beginning of my journey with him. If I had died right then and there, then I would have been like the thief on the cross that knew I was a sinner and I knew I deserved punishment. And Jesus said to that sinner, today you will be in paradise with me. So the hour I first believed 
was the moment I was saved. I received that seed. I received the good news of salvation, which is for everyone. Because God wants none to perish. Now, moving on to hope, because that was believing. Now, again, it was very immature faith. I was still very carnal. But it was because of the good news of knowing that Jesus died for me, knowing that he loved me enough to do that for me, made me want to draw to him. I wanted to draw nearer and grow to, to, to get to know him. I actually now had hope because the enemy had tried to steal it from me. The enemy had told me I was going to hell. The enemy had told me that um, there was nothing I could do. So you might as well just kick up your heels and keep sinning because um, you are not um, You know, you've done it. You've crossed a line that you can't be forgiven. You've crossed a line that you can't, you're not going to heaven. And so because I believe that, because he stole my hope, I was almost about to go down the worst path ever to destruction, to complete destruction. But God comes to give you hope. The enemy comes to steal it. It is good news because it gives us hope. If the gospel doesn't give you hope, then it's not the gospel. So I'm sharing this because I believe the moment that I was saved. Uh, sorry, I was saved the moment I believed. Forgive me, Lord. I was saved the moment I believed. And I began a journey as a baby in Christ to maturity. And it is a journey of endurance. It's not a fast race. <laughs> it can be quite slow and laboring. <laughs> um, and the, the key is, is that we continue in that race. When we fall, we get back up again. We stumble, we ask for forgiveness, we get back up. It's the enemy that wants to knock you down and keep you down. Um, and there are people that will believe the lies of the enemy. They will abandon faith and they will walk away. But that's not what God wants. God wants none to perish. He gives us all the readings, all the writings in the scripture to tell us the way. We, we do have to endure. We have to continue. We have to get back up again. But we don't get back up again if our hope has been stolen. We get back up again because we hope in his salvation. We hope in his faithfulness to forgive. Because God is faithful even when we aren't. So, yes, you can fall away. And it is very hard to bring someone back in again. The scripture tells us that. But God is still a father with arms open, open wide. He wants his prodigal sons to come home, his prodigal sons and daughters. Angels in heaven rejoice when we turn around and turn back towards him. And he doesn't wait for us to walk all the way home, but he runs out to greet us. So I suppose I'm doing this because the gospel is a gospel of good news. Now, I want to reinforce something, though. Because people that want to debate this topic... You know, you can choose one side of your argument and just look up all the scriptures to support that and you can look up the other side and choose all your scriptures to support that. Believe you me, I've been there. I've been there. 
And I've had the battle in my mind as also in relation to am I saved or am I not? We're not meant to be in confusion. We're not meant to be double-minded. Mm -mm. And faith in anything else but the Lord for our salvation is idolatry because we're putting our faith in our own works. When God said he will finish the good work he started in you. So we seek the Lord. For him to do those things in us. We seek after him. We draw near to him. We seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness over other things, over the things of this world, so that he can perfect those things in us, so that he can bring us to maturity, so that we can overcome and have peace and joy in all circumstances. It is a journey. We do have to endure all the way to the very end. But it's about staying in a relationship with Jesus Christ and growing and maturing and not letting that seed of faith wither and die and turning away from it. The enemy is the one that comes to steal and destroy our, our, our hope and our faith, not God. So when you have feelings of defeat, or hopelessness, or that God has turned his back on you, they're not from God. They're from the enemy. God will convict us through his word. That is for certain. The word is a double-edged sword that is meant to convict us and encourage us. He will convict us of sin so that we want to turn from it and walk in the way of righteousness. But he doesn't. He doesn't, he does it in love. He doesn't do it to condemn us and, and throw us away. He does it to correct us because a good father does that. He disciplines us. I want to share with you a dream the Lord once gave me, and I have done a video on it before, um, but I had been praying for hope because I was going through a season in my life where I didn't have much hope at the time. And I, I also had been receiving dreams and visions from the Lord about the destruction that is coming upon the earth. And I felt hopeless for the lost. I really felt hopeless. I just, I didn't know what to do about all the information God was giving me. But I asked the Lord to give me hope. And so one night I was just, I was just sketching a picture while I was praying to God and tears were falling rolling down my face while I was talking to God. I was talking to him about all the things he'd shared with me and talking to him about wanting, needing hope, a sign of hope. And I was sketching a rose at the time. I love roses, my favourite flower. And as I drew the rose, I asked the Lord if he could give me a rose in a dream. I didn't care what dream he gave me next. I didn't care if it was a dream about more destruction that was coming, but could he just give me a a rose in the background as a sign of hope because at that point I was just so distraught about the things the Lord had shown me that I was very discouraged. Three days later he gave me a dream and in that dream I was holding on to a rose and right before me I saw that rose go from a bud to blooming and then the petals would drop off but the moment the petals dropped off a little bud would come back out again and it would bloom again and then the petals would drop off and another flower it was one flower but that flower continued to bud bloom fall bud bloom fall over and over again and the Lord was saying to me that hope was everlasting hope was eternal hope continues it doesn't die. And in the dream, I then saw the pan view out and I was standing in a field of roses and it reminded me when I woke of a field of dandelions and how you might pick them up and blow them for like a wish. Uh, but yeah, I was standing in a field of roses 
and the rose just never died. It just continued over and over and over again. And so the Lord was giving me that sign that I asked for, sign of hope. Hope is eternal. Hope is everlasting. And anything that comes to steal, steal your hope is the enemy. Now, when I shared that dream in a video, the video cut short. I've had a lot of troubles, technical dramas. And sometimes when you're trying to get a video done, you just kind of give up retrying because you run out of storage. So um, I didn't add the end of the dream in that video. And this is really important. I didn't really focus on the significance of the ending. Um, but in the dream, I woke up within the dream. So I was still dreaming, but I woke up within the dream and I was so excited about seeing this rose in the dream that I called my kids excitedly into my room and they were sitting on my bed, um, on my queen bed in, in the main room, main bedroom, and I'm telling them about the dream the Lord gave me with the roses. And I was so excited. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw out the, my bedroom window and what appeared to be someone in black, completely in black, and the word I had in my spirit was Nephilim. But they were tall, very tall, like a giant. And I knew in my spirit they were in my garden trying to steal my roses. And then I woke from the dream. Now, I was very focused on the first part of the dream, the, first, the dream before the dream within the dream. But it was very important because God was showing to me that the enemy is always seeking to steal my hope. He is always, always, he's relentless. He was trying to steal my roses. He was trying to steal my hope. And a gospel that doesn't have hope is not the gospel because it's good news. It gives us hope. And we walk towards that. And... I have to share something else with you too because I was in chains because I doubted my salvation. And if you doubt your salvation, that is the enemy stealing your hope. I was in chains. Now, I, I need to, to explain this to you because God took a while to strip me away of this. I had a relationship that was verbally and emotionally abusive. I loved my husband and I still do. I'm not in that relationship anymore. I still love him and I forgive him. He didn't know what he was doing, but he hurt me a lot. And I strived so hard strived to be a good wife but I felt like nothing I did was ever enough people sometimes strive in the flesh to be good for God they're working in their own effort to produce good works they think because it says um you know, faith without works is dead. They think they have to do works and they're striving in their own flesh to do these works. And they think that every time they stuff up, God is angry at them. And I thought that because I was used to a toxic relationship where someone was angry with me all the time, that they didn't measure up. And I carried that over into my relationship with God where I thought that God was angry with me every time I stuffed up. And when you think God is angry with you, you hide. You feel ashamed. You hide like Adam and Eve in the garden. God knows everything. He sees everything. He doesn't want us to hide. He is faithful to forgive those that ask. Come forward to him. Lay your sin on the table and ask him to cleanse you. 
Ask him to do the work in you. Ask him to strip away those things that are unclean. Surrender your will so that he can do it in you. So when the Bible also says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 to 7 that they have a form of godliness but deny deny the power thereof. We know there are Christians, sorry, there are some people that profess the name of God. They profess the name of Jesus. They profess the name of the Lord but they have a dead faith because they deny the power of God to change them. So I'm trying to tell you the reason that your faith, that faith without works is dead is not because of your own works. It's not because you're trying to tick off the box of trying to be good for God and always thinking you're failing or that you've lost your salvation every time you stumble. God says, have faith in him, surrender to him. Yes, pick up your cross and follow. That's a part of staying on the the race of endurance. That's a part of getting back up and continuing this race, continuing this journey and not giving up. And as you continue to follow Christ, through his power, you will crucify the desires of the flesh. And you will be resurrected to new life in him. But you have to understand it is the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you that produces that work, not you. You can, you can take no credit for it. You cannot glorify in the works of your own hands. All praise and glory goes to God for the change that will happen in you. And that is why we cast our crowns at his feet in the book of Revelation when we stand before the throne. Because we're not deserving of the crowns. We did nothing. God did all the work from beginning to finish, from the moment he created us, to leading us in his spirit, to preparing the soil of our heart before we even received the seed, the, the seed by coordinating divine appointments so that people would speak into our lives and that we would be ready to receive the seed of the word so that then we, we that seed would be planted into good soil. And that he would water us and nourish us and, 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 and help us to produce fruit. Everything is him. And all praise and glory belongs to Jesus Christ alone. Nothing you did yourself. So. I just wanted to say that. Um, It's really important that no one loses faith or loses hope in a God, in God, sorry, in the one and only God who, who is our salvation. Our trust should be fully in him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything that you've placed on my heart to share today. I pray that it helps someone in their journey today. Lord, I hope it, I hope it brings clarity to the body of Christ and unity, Lord, because we're not called to be divided. But we're called to be one in spirit, in mind, in truth. Because we've put on the mind of Christ and we've taken off our carnal nature, Lord. Please give us understanding and wisdom and revelation so that we can truly walk in unity. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to add, last thing to this message, love. Love is the most important thing. We know that we're meant to love God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and love our neighbour as ourselves. Love is the most important thing and love manifests itself in actions, not just words. Proverbs 
for us to abide in the love of God. It happens because, like, his, he loved us first. He loved us from the beginning. He loved us so much he sent his son to die on the cross so that to take the punishment for our sins. He is our atonement. So it's that love that he has for us that transforms us because we want to return that love to him. He laid down his life for us. We want to return that love. And we draw closer to him and we get to know him better. And one of the things that the Lord placed on my spirit some time ago to share with people is those people that deny the power of God, that profess him with their mouth, are often like fans. A fan can, um, you know, of a worldly person, like someone who is a sports fan or a, a groupie, um, they can know so much about a person Um but they don't have a personal relationship with them. So you get, people can idolise an actor, for instance, and they can read every magazine and read an autobiography and know all these different things about the person. But if they met them in person, they don't know them. There's a whole lot you don't know about a person that can't be written in pages, you know, or, or on in magazine articles or just know them because of the, the characters they play in a movie. And so Jesus says there's a lot of people that know him or know of him but don't know him. When you get to know him in a personal relationship through reading his word, praying to him and listening to his voice. Because the Bible says my sheep hear my voice and they follow. They follow. They won't follow another. We love him. We, we, we fall in love with his character, his attributes, everything that is beautiful about him. He's, he's holy and pure and perfect and, and amazing. And when you fall in love with him, obedience comes out of love. You're abiding in his love. You're abiding in the, the vine. And then it manifests in your life to love others and to be merciful to others and to forgive others like he has done for you. That is pure, undefiled love. God wants that to happen in everyone. And this is the time. This is the time of the maturing. This is the time of removing the chafe. God is separating the wheat from the tares. And tribulation is a period of testing to remove the chafe from our lives. To remove the sin. It has a purpose that God will use for his glory. And we should have hope. We can still have hope in the midst of tribulation. The enemy comes to steal and destroy it. But God has a purpose and a plan. And many people will be refined through tribulation and made holy and spotless. So I want to encourage you all today to keep the faith. Keep hoping in our Saviour and his ability to bring all things to completion, to make you ready to stand before him and continue to love above all things. Love God, love others. Because remember that, oh, sorry, the scripture has gone from my mind momentarily. Love, here it is. Thank you, Lord. Love covers a multitude of sins. So remain in his love. 
God bless you all. I hope to see you soon. Bye.